Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the Nixium Colt. They were exposed because they branded their female participants and is just a really heartbreaking story as well as um, just surprising for how long this took to come public. If you want to learn more about the Nixium Colt, then just keep on watching. Do you guys like my new plant? I've been wanting a plant for my background and I found this one at Michael's and I just I love it so much it's so cute so today we're gonna be talking about a cult like I said in the intro um, I've been reading up on this for about a week and like researching and it's just it's such a roller coaster so first I want to kind of like give you the definition of what is a cult it is a system of religious ver veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. For this specific cult, they actually did two documentaries on two different platforms. They did a HBO Max documentary, and that one is called The Bow, and then they did another one on the Stars um, subscription, which is called Seduced. And I watched both of them when I was doing my research um, just obviously so that I could get kind of like both perspectives now the one on HBO um, called The Vow it focuses more on one specific um, participant of the cult um, her name is India Oxenberg and she's a daughter of a kind of famous actress in that documentary they base it more off of her experience kind of like what she went through and then the one on stars which is called seduced they went more in depth um, with uh, Sarah Edmondson I believe her last name Edmondson um, and then they she's kind of like the one that like started or came out publicly about everything that was kind of like going on within this quilt so how did Nixon get started? In 1998, Keith Ranieri and Nancy Salzman founded Nixon as a self-help organization in Albany, New York. It is estimated that around 1,800 people got enrolled in their courses throughout the years. Members became followers of Keith and started calling him Vanguard, as well as describing him as the most ethical man in the world. So Vanguard, according to Keith, means that he is the leader of a philosophical movement. Nancy Salzman, Keith's partner in business, um, was called the prefect in this whole organization. It is often the head of school. Nixon was often described as a community guided by humanitarian principles that seek to empower people and answer important questions as to what it means to be human. Nixon was the top of the umbrella and underneath it had many different Courses. Most people enrolled in the Nixium courses through their ESP, which stands for Executive Success Programs. Participants would pay more than $700 for a 12-hour course featuring Nixium's Patent Executive Programs technology, which was a patchwork of different techniques including self-help programs, religious ideal ideologies, and hypnosis techniques. The mission of all the ESP programs, the executive success programs, was designed to help individuals to develop the emotional and intellectual skill necessary to reach their maximum potential in all areas of their life. Once a participant was part of the ESP programs, they would get something called a sash, and I'm going to insert a picture here, and it's basically kind of like a silk scarf that would represent kind of like in what level they were in the ESP programs. Participants after getting their sash, they would be part of the stripe path and it was just basically kind of like the pyramid that you would have to go up um, when you would take more courses and become a coach, a proctor, and there were like different titles to different jobs. And each color of the silk scarf meant a different um, level in the program. The white sash meant that you were a student um, and a yellow sash would mean that you were a coach. 
Keith and Nancy would wear a white sash and he would describe that because they were students of life. So part of the curriculum also was for them to obviously learn about Keith and he's um, in his teachings and everything. Participants were told that Keith was part of the Guinness Book World Records because he had gotten one of the top scores of an IQ test. We're told that he was one of the top problem solvers in the world and that he had also had three degrees in mathematics, biology, and computer science. I mean, you would ask yourself, you know, where is Keith and Nancy getting all the money to be able to fund all these courses from the beginning and, you know, kind of like have this type of like organization? Apart, obviously, from the um, money that they're getting from tuition, much of the money from Nixon came from Claire and Sarah Brofman which um, I did a little bit of research on them and they basically come from a family that owns kind of like alcohol companies and that they make alcohol. So because Keith obviously wanted people to believe in him and kind of like believe in his vision and what he wanted to create, Sarah and Claire actually put together um, for da the Dalai Lama to come to the United States. Um, he was at first going to come to Albany, but he, they actually did cancel that first visit because the media started to pick up on the um, on the organization cult. And um, they were getting this rumor that, you know, they were a cult-like organization. And obviously, a lot of people believe that, you know, it was a cult and you were right. Claire and Sarah, or actually Keith and Nancy, kind of conv convinced the sisters and they decided to go to where the Dalai Lama lives and they were able to get a um, meeting with him and kind of like convince him um, of Keith and kind of like convince um, like how good Keith's ideas are and he was such a philanthropist and he just wanted to help people. And so at that point they get the, the meeting. Um, in the meeting you can kind of like tell that the Dalai Lama was a little bit apprehensive to like even talking to Keith. Um, and you can like kind of like see it in the meeting. It's kind of odd. Um, so they get the meeting and so the Dalai, the Dalai Lama agreed to come to the United States. This was a strategy because Keith wanted to be like, hey, like the Dalai Lama believes in me. You should too. That's what I think. And so, um, they got the meeting because they got a picture together. It was more of a publicity stunt. Um, than anything than anything else. Now, part of the curriculum of Nixium um, was for them to celebrate, obviously, Keith's life. In one of the documentaries, um, one of Keith's um, girlfriends, she kind of like was a millionaire, and she had, I believe, like real estate or something like that, and she quit like that job to come and help Keith, kind of like put together this whole course and everything and so um, she was the one that started V week or Vanguard week and it was kind of like the week prior to um, Keith's birthday so the last day of the week was Keith's birthday and during this week they would um, they put together a bunch of activities like they spent so much money to get these activities for the week they had like chess matches they had dance singing um, kayaking running dancing um, amongst a lot of other activities so all the participants that went to Vanguard week were very very busy every single hour of the day the last day of Vanguard week which like I said it was Vanguard's, um, it was Keith's birthday. Every center, so at this point there were a lot of centers. They were in Mexico City, LA, Oregon, Seattle, obviously the one in Albany, New York. Um, and I believe there were a couple that were like worldwide. So every center's participants and like coaches and stuff, they came together and like put a performance and then they would perform in front of Keith and the whole, you know, the whole organization that was there for that week they rented this huge house um and so they kind of like presented the performance for him now during this week the participants were not allowed to take any sort of pictures videos anything and the only ones that could take pictures and videos 
were um, Keith's camera people and he had a whole production um, that would record the whole event and um, record him. I guess he wanted also to like document um, his life sort of and so they would record everything that was kind of like going on that week but nobody else was um, allowed to. The whole filming crew was actually led by Mark Vicente and he was actually um, a director and he kind of like had like a one-hit wonder with the movie What the Beep Do We Know or something like that. Um, I remember watching the movie, I don't know, like years ago. Um, and so he was kind of like, um, he was the leader of the filming crew for Keith. He became Keith's right hand um, in the whole organization and... Um, uh, he actually plays a huge role as to how everything came up um, and became like public. So one of the weeks of Vanguard Weeks, um, this was on August 26, 2015, Rosa Laura Junco presented a gift to Keith in front of everybody. And um, this gift, she described it as a gift from herself and the whole of the Nixon community. So she basically said that before that year ended, so before 2015 ended, that they have started construction for Keith tw for Keith's 20 million dream science lab, which included a stem cell lab as well as a brain lab with MRI machines and all of the progressive technology. She went on to say, Mr. O'Neary is, for those who don't know, an RPI's first triple major. I'm assuming RPI was kind of like the university. He has degrees in mathematics and biology in physics. Keith was honored in 1989 by the Genius Book of World Records in the category of highest IQ in human history. Now, it was really funny because in one of the... Um, in one of the documentaries, um, a journalist, she's kind of like the main journalist in this case, um, she actually like was able to get the actual Guinness Book of World Records um, from eBay and that was like the only, um, that was like the only version and it was the Australian version that he comes up in the book. Like there was no other, like there was not in the US and so that was like kind of odd too like there's only one edition that he comes out and you're like okay we're gonna go ahead and believe you <laughs> uh and it later ended up coming up that he had a gpa of 2.26 and so obviously like people would people should have been suspicious and just researched the guy and not just believe everything that they were told but Again, it is a cult and the way that they brainwash and the way that they tell you things just, they just click in your mind, I guess. It's just something I did notice throughout the documentaries and something that was really odd was that he would, Keith would kiss the female participants on the lips. Um, I didn't notice if he would do this with other men, um, but he definitely like kissed them on the lips every single like female that would come up there was one um participant that she actually you know said that she found that very uncomfortable that she would kiss um like everybody on the lips and she was started to think she was started thinking like what was wrong with her and why did she find that uncomfortable for her um and i mentioned this because that's something that i noticed um throughout the documentaries they show you snippets of keith's kind of like teaching teachings and stuff and kind of like he describes a lot how um, you make yourself the victim and how you need to start thinking, why does this make me uncomfortable? Like, what's the trauma behind this that makes me uncomfortable? And so, you know, she started thinking, you know, what is wrong with me that I find this uncomfortable? And if you look at it, you're like, no, no, like it is, it is weird that he is kissing like the females on the lips, every single one of them. Like that, there's nothing wrong with you. Like you should not think that way. But I wanted to mention this just so you can get like a glimpse into like Keith's mind because it was just mind blowing. And in one of the classes, Keith is talking about how in many civilizations in Rome, Greece, adults would have a sexual apprenticeship um, with six year olds, seven year olds. And this was very common. Now, I do want to mention that I have heard this before. 
um, in one of the class in one of my college classes I remember uh, my teacher mentioning the this but then this is what Keith's like the way that he describes it um, because now obviously obviously we were to know you know there's an adult having sexual intercourse with a six-year-old seven-year-old you know we would obviously identify them as up and so you know it is abuse and so Keith goes on to describe this and he says that someone who we would call abused and he used air quotes um, by a father um, and that the girl would really love it and really enjoy it there was no moment that she didn't like until she rec she was recognized by society that it was abuse so who abused who now this is his way of thinking so if there was a point that there was a little girl that was being abused um, but she let's say that enjoyed it or whatever that if you if you think about it that that would not happen at all like that would not happen but let's say he says that you know she herself would have enjoyed it and whatever she's not she's not playing the victim you know because she doesn't see it as something wrong but she starts seeing it as something wrong once society tells her clearly this shows already kind of like his mind and the way that he thinks about you know victims of abuse which you are a victim like you can't it gets me so upset they are the ones that make themselves the victims that's his way of thinking you make yourself the victim it doesn't matter what situation you are it doesn't matter if you get it doesn't matter anything like you make yourself the victim this is kind of like where you start you know kind of like puzzling together and they were he was basically grooming people so about seven years after NSP, um, the executive success program started, there was another program that they created called Jeunesse. And this was a women's only group. And it was one of the newer programs for Nixium. And at the same time, they did create a men only group, which was SOP. And it was for Society of Protectors. Mm -hmm. In the promotional video for Jeunesse, uh, Nancy talks about how um, Jeunesse was the very first women's only group that was created by a man. So Jeunesse was a new set of program and it helped understand the gender roles between male and female experiences in life. Keith would explain that, you know, men are monogamous and that they should not need to be a part of a poly relationship, meaning, you know, only two people in their relationship, that men are monogamous and that they should be able to have other um, relationships with other women, other men, whatever they wanted, because that's just a man's nature. Some of the women that were part of the Jeunesse program started recruiting other women and talking about a secret group that was only for women and that it was completely secret and that they could not talk about it, ask questions about it. Um, to anybody else in order for the women to be able to even know information about this secret group they had to give collateral information to one of to the person that was or the woman that was kind of like trying to recruit them so we're going to be talking specifically about Allison Mack and yes this Allison Mack which the um actors from Smallville so in this part, Allison Mack played a huge role in recruiting these women for this secret group. So the name of this group was called DOS and it stands for Dominus Obsequious Sororium, which meant Master Slave Dynamic Group. The um, women that were part of um, this group, like I said, they had to give collateral and that could be um, turning in like nude pictures or important information about their families, like secrets and stuff. And this collateral would be used um, in the case that would w that these women wanted to go public with uh, this group. They would be released. Um, so these pictures, information, they would be released by the people above them in that group. So at the top of this chart, it was Keith and he was the grand um, master and then um, um, underneath him, it would be Allison and she, like I said, played a huge role in this because she was kind of like the one in charge of recruiting these women. 
And one of Allison's saves was um, India, which was, you know, the document that was based on the HBO one. And so for this part, I'm going to describe more of uh, what specifically India Oxenberg went through because she, I feel like they went more in depth as to like the assignments and kind of like um, what they had to do. One of India's assignments um, was that she had to seduce Keith. And in order to do that, um, she needed to get a, a naked picture taken by Keith. And this was kind of like the initiation process within the DOS group. And um, this was an assignment that was not given to everyone, uh, but there were a couple of other participants that mentioned that, you know, their slave, their masters had asked them to do that. And so after that, that assignment had been done, um, are there things were starting to be asked by Allison and she told India that she needed to weigh 106 pounds and that she needed to start losing weight and in order to do this um, and this was across the board like all the slaves had to ask this to their master was um, they had to text their master master can I eat this and then would put like the amount of calories that they were gonna eat um, and they had to keep doing this like every single day ask if they could eat a certain amount of calories and for India for example her calorie intake daily was 500 calories she was only allowed to eat 500 calories a day um, to, and checking in with her master, which was Allison. India started noticing that she started, she stopped getting her period. And Allison actually told her like, oh, it's fine. Like I haven't had my period in, you know, a couple years. So you're good. No worries. Um, and again, at this same time, India's mom started like noticing you know how invested India was in this and you know they would ask her and she was like no no it's fine like I'm okay um, at one point Allison did take pictures of her slaves um, when they were naked and the and she sent this picture to Keith and Keith replied all mine with the little devil emoji yeah Keith began asking India specifically for more explicit pictures um, and Keith again would go back and would say well if you're uncomfortable you may you may be doing something right because in order for you to grow and just develop you know um, just become a better human you would have to do something that makes you uncomfortable and that was kind of like his philosophy. India at this point um, and other slaves started um, or they had to start turning turning in collateral every month. So they began to turn in that monthly to their masters. He wanted all the women to himself. It was time for a more permanent permanent commitment. Those members were going to get branded. And this is kind of like, this is the huge part of this whole kind of like story. Um, because this is why it got obviously, obviously the public's um, attention. This was described as the absolute commitment to each other, to masters and slaves. So this was a commitment that the slaves had for their masters. Slaves were told that the symbol was going to be a symbol of the elements. So fire, earth, water, and sky. But it was going to be a bonding experience for the woman in the DOS group and it was a practice of building character. Now there was like a whole ceremony around you know getting branded. Ceremonies day came and all the slaves or all of Allison's slaves walked in her, to her room and she had placed a table where obviously they were gonna lie down and while one of the slaves were on the table, Allison would read the ceremony script, which, oh my god, this is wild. So the script said, The best slave derives the highest pleasure from being her master's ultimate tool, dependent of use. So while the person was getting branded, they were supposed to say, feel the pain, feel the love. 
There was a point where Catherine uh, confronted India about this um, and she asked, you know, like, did you get branded? And India said, yeah, I wanted to get branded. She was so brainwashed that she thought that getting branded was okay. When Catherine told her, like, you got branded with Keith's initials, and she was like, no, I didn't. It's a, it's a symbol of the elements. And so, obviously, later came up that it was Keith's initials. They got branded with Keith Ranieri's initials. And I'm going to put a picture here so you can see. Lauren Salzman, which was Nancy's sister, she actually testified and she said that the women in Dawes were subjected to many punishment, punishments, including getting whipped with a leather strap or being asked to stand barefoot in the snow. So in order to try and save India's life, Catherine um, and other former members of the Nixium um, went to the New York State authorities to investigate and kind of like tell them what was going on. Uh, but unfortunately, there was not a lot of um, movement in that. Police, I guess, they did not think that this was important enough for them to actually go and investigate Nixium. And so Sarah Edmondson, she actually decided to go public with this. And um, she had what she had been working with Catherine and with Mark Vicente with a New York Times um, writer and journalist. And um, the article was kind of like kept on hold for many months because um, it wasn't a big of a story. And this is what the journalist has said. And so there was a point where another um, another journalist took this article or took this information and decided to write upon it. And Sarah was the first one to come public with her brand. It was like it was crazy she woke up and everybody was texting her and she was front page of the new york times and i'll insert a picture here of kind of like the top of the article so after gathering all the information they could they were able to get an arrest warrant for keith but unfortunately he had escaped to mexico while nixon was crashing down he actually ordered Allison and some other slaves to come down to Mexico for a recommitment ceremony, which was a sexual act to him. They described that he wanted to basically have sex with them. So thanks to one of the women that had gone um, down there to him, she had posted a picture on um, online of a landmark in Puerto Vallarta and that's how they were able to narrow down that he was down there and they were able to arrest him. So the day of the trial came, which was May 7, 2019. Nancy Selman was charged with identity theft and altering records to influence the outcome of a lawsuit against Nixon. Allison Mack, whose involvement in Nixon boosted the case profile, pleaded guilty to recording and recording conspiracy charges related to her role in the organization. Prosecutors dropped the charges of sex trafficking and conspiracy to commit commit sex trafficking and forced labor against her. As she was in federal district court, Allison sobbed as she admitted that she would lure women into DOS by saying that they would be a part of a women's mentorship program. Instead, officials said that she had recruited them into a society as slaves and somehow were required to have sex with Keith Ranieri. Right now, she's facing up to 20 years in prison on each count to which she pleaded guilty. She was scheduled to be sentenced on September 11, 2019, but the date has since been postponed. On June 19, 2019, Keith was found guilty on all seven accounts, including uh, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, as well as possession of child pornography, and he received 120 years in prison. Yeah, that is it for today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something. It was really heartbreaking to read um the the story of the women that suffered so much through um this cult um as always the products that i use in this video are going to be linked down in the description box as well as my social media and until then i'll see you guys on my next one bye